Hello everybody, welcome to this guide to getting started in Guild Wars 2. My name is Sizzix, and I've been playing Guild Wars 2 since the pre-launch early access days, and today I'll be guiding you through getting into the game and navigating through your entry into the grand open world of Tyria, where you can leave those gear treadmills behind forever. I have a soft spot in my heart for this game, and it always seems to welcome me back with open arms, so I thought, why not take my time and experience and help some people out in discovering the game that has brought me so many hours of enjoyment. So without further ado, let's get started. Step one is to get the game installed. Who could have guessed? There's two main ways to do this in 2023. The first is through the official ArenaNet standalone installer. This is the original way to play the game, and you can, if you so choose, be able to log in and out of different ArenaNet accounts this way, in case for some reason you ever wanted to do that. There is a link in the description down below that will take you to the download page on the ArenaNet website, or you can Google it yourself if you so choose. You will need to make an ArenaNet account as well doing it this way, and so doing it on the website is a good time to handle it while the launcher downloads and installs. The second and much newer way is to download it via Steam. The only disadvantage that you may experience with this is that your login is tied to your Steam account, so if you ever lose your password or decide to stop using Steam, you're going to have a bad time. Please note that the much longer download for this process will occur once you are in the launcher. So if you're going to do this step and then go eat, tell your animals that they're the best animal out there and no other animal can compare, or stare at the ceiling in existential dread, I would recommend getting into the installer and logging in before performing any additional tasks. Step two is server selection. Once you have the game installed and you are logged in, you can click the play button and it will, for the first time, bring you to the server selection screen. Now, the good news about Guild Wars 2 compared to many other MMOs of days past is that your server selection has very little bearing on the things that you can do and who you can do them with. The primary division here is that the North American servers are all together and the European servers are all together. So if you have most of your friends playing on EU servers or American servers, I suggest that you follow those groupings. Currently, the only game type your specific server matters is in World vs. World, which is a large-scale server-based persistent PvP battle that can be quite fun. While ArenaNet is in the process of changing the way this works with the alliances system, in which it will be based off of guilds and their alliances. This is still in beta testing processes, so I would still recommend at the time of recording in 2023, if this game type interests you, making sure you select the same server as your friends for the time being. All other content, you can group up with strangers or friends from any server in your server group, whether it's open world content, dungeons, fractals, strike missions, raids, or just hanging out having a fashion contest in Lion's Art. Step 3, we start getting to the good bits, character creation. Now, your race selection, I would recommend just picking what seems the most interesting and pleasant to look at for you. Aside from appearances, there are a few minor things that this choice will affect. Your introductory tutorial zone is unique to each race, but once you make it out of the short introductory instance for level 1 characters, you can travel to any of the open world starter zones. After this, your race and the choices you make in the character creator will still impact your story for the first quarter of your leveling experience or so, so just choose what seems the most interesting to you and and enjoy the ride. The only actual gameplay mechanic that your race affects is a few race-specific abilities that you unlock. They can be fun and even a bit useful, but they're really not up to par with the class abilities that you unlock that can be taken instead of them, so they're quite negligible for gameplay. Gender also does not matter aside from cosmetics and character voice, so pick whatever you like here. Class selection. This guide is aimed at people who are just getting started and likely on free-to-play accounts, so if you're playing without the expansions like I am in this video, you will have access to eight of the nine classes in Guild Wars 2. The classes are broken down in each row by heavy, medium, and light armor, and each have a general feel to them that will probably feel familiar to you if you've played many RPGs before. Each of them have different but often overlapping weapons to choose from, a general class mechanic, as well as things they excel at and abilities unique to them. The Heavies, Guardian. Wearing heavy armor and a smug sense of self-righteousness, this is the Paladin of the group. Still capable of dishing out plenty of damage depending on your traits and weapon selections, but with a healthy dose of group support and sustainability. Very melee focused, I personally find their range to be a little lacking unless you go down a specific path only available if you have the expansions. Their class mechanic is about different virtues and using them to buff your allies in different ways depending on what your group may need at that moment in a battle. The Warrior. 
Heavy Armor likes to get hit and hit back hard. As they fight, they gain Adrenaline, which they expend in a burst skill that generally does far more damage and something special compared to their normal skills, scaling based on how angry they are. Think Fighter in D&D terms. They have mostly melee weapons, but a few ranged options as well. Revenant. The final and newest class in the game, also wielding heavy armor and the heavy weight of the expectations of the dead hero spirits it calls upon. No, seriously. The Revenant's thing is they call upon the powers of spirits of heroes to change their abilities and do special things. While other classes can switch their utility skills freely to mix and match, Revenants have a total of seven stances, which give them unique abilities and playstyles, and can choose two at a time they can swap between in combat. Many melee options, but does have ranged as well. Their class mechanic is swapping between the stances. The mediums. Engineer. When I first started, this was the most Guild Wars class option to me, and really still is. I've never really played anything like an Engineer in an MMO before. Unlike most classes who have many weapons, Engineers by default only have the pistol, rifle, and shield when they're on land, and the harpoon gun when they're underwater, although the expansions do expand upon the amount of weapons they have. Rather than having a wide variety of equipable weapons, they instead focus on weapon kits, backpacks, or turrets, at least in the vanilla Guild Wars experience, as their utility skills to equip different skill sets on the fly, such as a grenade throwing kit or a flamethrower kit or even a bomb laying kit. This is their main class mechanic, is the different kits and abilities that they have, as well as their Elixir X. When you get the expansions elite specs, you can get hammer, sword, or mace, as well as some different kits based on their specific playstyles. Thief. The quintessential rogue character of the ensemble, the thief has good ranged and melee options with a focus on evasion, stealth, and burst damage. Their class mechanic is their initiative, which you can think of as an energy system. Their primary attack skills don't have cooldowns, but do cost initiative, allowing you to set up a flurry of damage, but you need to have good sustained strategy afterwards, or it's just going to be a bit awkward as you have to explain that really honestly, this usually doesn't happen. They also have a nifty steal ability, which can temporarily give you a buff or attack of sorts, often depending on who you stole it from. Ranger. You probably don't need me to explain it, but I'm going to anyway. The quintessential nature-based ranger with a companion pet. A good blend of ranged and melee combat options with this one can go around collecting all of the 59 unique pet types currently in the game, all of which have different abilities, and similar to Revenants, depending on spec, can swap between two pets at any one time, but have full access to their library of pets outside combat. While I started the game as a warrior, my ranger has certainly become one of my most favorite classes in my arsenal. Their class mechanic is their pet control and synergy with their pet. The Lights the Mesmer. Very much an illusionist, they also have long and short ranged options, as do the other two light armor casters in the list. They have some very fun abilities, one of which being the ability to set up a portal at one location, then move to another location and drop a portal there, allowing temporary free travel between the two points for them and other people who choose to use it. Their main class feature is using illusions and clones to confuse enemies and cause additional damage and debuffs with their shatter skills. The more clones you have out at once up to a certain point, the more powerful your special shatter abilities become. It is worth noting that the newest elite specialization doesn't use clones at all, but a similar mechanic with illusory weapons that is still there as far as building up points and then using them to unleash chaos. You have the warrior's sword and the ranger's bow. But don't worry, once you're dead, the Necromancer has your back. The Necromancer has various long and short-ranged weapons, all of them having range to them, but just varying amounts of it. Their class mechanic is all based around drawing life force from their enemies as they fight, which can then be used to activate their Death Shroud ability, which will grant you additional hit points based on the energy you had stored and give you access to new powerful abilities. They also get minions, and who doesn't love summoning some little buddies to help you weed whack the countryside. If you grew up watching Avatar The Last Airbender, stick with me because Elementalist might be the class for you. Like the Necromancer, they have short and long-ranged weapons, but unlike most classes in Guild Wars, cannot swap weapons during combat. Rather than swapping weapons to gain access to new abilities, they swap between four different attunements. You know what they are. Say it with me, everybody. Water, earth, fire, and air. 
Each one changes your primary five skills and you can switch between them during combat and each aspect has a different specialty to it that it sort of sticks to. Damage, support, control, defensive capabilities. Each weapon changes what flavor and range skills these abilities you will have access to. Uh, they can certainly be one of the most complicated classes to play but can be very rewarding if you develop the skill with them. Once you get through the class selection, you will make a few choices here that will flavor your character a bit. You choose a starting piece of gear or pet if you're a ranger that your character has emotional attachment to and sort of stands for something to them. Pick out whether your character prefers to be charming, dignified, or ferocious when talking to people in some dialogue options or cutscenes. You then make a few choices that differ depending on the race that you've selected that determines your character's personal story. Just trust your gut and pick out what sounds good to you here. Uh, then you get to name your character and then dive into the game at long last or short last. Depends on if you're a five minute or five hour character creation type of person. Once you watch cutscene showing your character, a bit about the race and the specific choices you made in character creation, you'll be into the introductory instance. Congratulations! It's almost time to hit things with various flavors of pain. Step 4. Now that you're in the world, it's time to familiarize yourself with the user interface, or UI, of the game. At the upper left is a mini menu with icons here. More will be added after the tutorial zone, and we'll get to them later. The most important th thing here is the settings, which is the cogwheel that can also be accessed by pressing the escape key and selecting options. All of your hotkeys, graphics, and audio settings can be accessed here. In case your resolution is messed up, something doesn't sound right, or you need to figure out a control really quick during the tutorial that hasn't popped up, it's good to know where this is right away before getting any further. You will see tutorial prompts like this one here as you continue playing that explain hotkeys like walking to you that can be closed by pressing the small X in them. I recommend reading these on your first playthrough. In the bottom left, you'll see a chat box, which displays player chats as well as nearby NPC chatter depending on the situation. In the bottom right is your minimap, which can be resized to rather small or rather large, as well as panned around, zoomed in, and out on very smoothly. Above that is where notifications will pop up as far as various rewards. Since you've probably just logged in for the first time on a free-to-play account, there will likely be two expansion icons here that you can left click to tell you more about the expansions and dismiss them. In the upper right corner is information menu for gameplay. This is known as the content guide. This is where your next story objective, as shown by the content guide, will be shown, as well as an arrow pointing the direction you need to go for that, the level recommended for it, the name of the story step, and a short description about it will be displayed here. Later on, you may have achievements displayed here as well, but we'll get to that. Finally, the bottom center of the screen displays instant information about your character's current status. You will have two abilities to start with. One is your basic attack, which is dictated by your class and equipped weapon, which is set by default to the one key. The other uh, is your default class healing ability, which is bound to the number six key with default hotkeys. You should hover over both of these and read the tooltips to learn what they do. You'll notice that depending on your class, there are multiple tooltips that appear when you hover over your number one ability. This is because some weapons have an auto attack chain, so each attack in that chain does a different thing, generally with the third and final one being the most powerful. You can also see that this ability is set to auto attack by default, which means that if you target an enemy and press it one time, it will continue to use that attack until that enemy dies or you change targets. Goodbye, button mashing. This is indicated by the arrows rotating around the ability square. In the center between these two, you can also see a large red orb with a number that displays your current health and a yellow bar which displays your current stamina. Your stamina is used when you dodge, which is a gameplay element that allows you to evade enemy attacks. The small line in the middle of your stamina bar indicates how many dodges you have. By default, you will have two before your stamina needs to recharge. However, some classes gain access to more dodges. The controls are very similar to most MMOs and completely customizable if you so choose. I have some control tips and settings advice that I'll share with you all at the very end of the video for those of you who are interested, but that's a bit denser so we'll save it for later. We have things to go smack in the name of justice. Now that you're familiar with everything, follow the content guide in the upper right and your minimap if you have to in order to follow the green star quest guides to continue the tutorial instance. As you go through and talk to people and kill some things, you 
you will eventually come to a sort of final boss for your tutorial instance. Keep in mind that if another player has started this event recently, it's possible that you'll come in partway through the final event. Use your auto attack ability to defeat the boss and heal yourself when and if necessary. This tutorial instance is partially guided by the game and uh, pretty difficult to mess up as there are some rails on it. Now, I will not be going into too much detail on this tutorial instance uh, to prevent spoilers for you, but the basic outline of the tutorial is the same for each race. Do some things, kill some stuff, kill a boss, and then you'll be in the open world. Congratulations! Now that you've gotten past the tutorial instance, you're now in the big wide world of Tyria and ready to start adventuring in the open world. At this point, I'm going to break the rest of this guide into a few parts that are as follows, and we'll have timestamps in the description below. I'll be going over PvE basics, structured PvP, world versus world, gathering, crafting, and banking, some social elements, and finally the settings recommendations I have for you all. Keep in mind that many of the general basics of gameplay such as boons, conditions, and travel will be covered in PvE basics, so if you would like to learn more about these, make sure to watch that section still. So let's get started. PvE basics. We'll start with the map and one of the in-game people related to that map is the scout. Anytime you're exploring a new zone, you should go talk to any new scouts you find. They reveal sections of the map and point out some nearby tasks for you to complete. It's not necessary, but can make things a bit easier for you. Talking to a scout happens to be your first objective after the tutorial, so we'll do that now. Find the NPC with the telescope above their head and interact with them. A short guided walkthrough of the immediate map area will occur at this time. They'll circle some tasks for you, reveal the area, and have some little bits of dialogue, and then we'll close your map. Now that you've talked to that scout, let's open your map back up with the M key. Let's break down what you're looking at. On the map, you can see at the upper left an overall breakdown of your total completion of the zone you're in, and above that a total world completion as well. You do get rewards for 100% completion of zones, as well as the world, so keep this little section in mind. There are are five different types of locations to complete and explore on a map for exploration purposes. There are tasks, aka hearts, as we like to call them. These are Guild Wars 2 versions of quests. You go to an area, you complete some specific tasks in that area to fill a bar up, and then you receive a reward upon completion of that task of some gold and some currency known as karma. Karma is a currency you get doing various actions in the game such as hearts or dynamic events that can be spent at specific NPC vendors. Any task that you complete, the NPC becomes a vendor that sells a few items to you for karma. Next up is waypoints. This is how you travel across the massive world of Tyria quickly and resurrect yourself if you meet an untimely end, indicated by these diamond shapes, and when you explore one, it will turn blue. Once you unlock a waypoint on a character, you can use it on that character forever by clicking on it to open a window prompt or double clicking to skip that and just teleport directly to it. Note, these do cost money to use and their cost increases the further away you are. So keep that in mind, especially very early on. You do start with a waypoint in each of the beginner tutorial zones. So if you want to meet up and play with a friend or get bored with the one you're currently in, you can always pop over to another race's starter zone. The third is points of interest or POIs. These are represented by little squares on the map, which will pop up a unique name for that spot you've discovered when you get there and grant you some experience points for experiencing more of the world. Up next are vistas, represented on the map by two stacked triangles. These are points on the world that you can travel to and press the interact button that give you a large sweeping camera view of the world as it is without any UI elements. Very fun to get some nice screenshots and just enjoy the world around you. Also grants you experience points. The final thing related to exploration is hero points. These are small challenges, either combat related that have a more difficult than usual combat encounter or an item or something like that to interact with that will grant you a hero point. Hero points are used in the training menu of the hero panel to purchase new skills and traits. I recommend once you can start spending these to look at all of your options. Eventually, you will get enough hero points to unlock all skills and complete specializations and elite specializations if and when you get through the expansion content, but it will take some time, so read up early on. Once you reach level 21 is when you will be able to purchase traits for your specializations. When you're out, 
out and about in the wide world of Tyria, another great source of karma, experience, and loot aside from tasks that is not shown on the map at all times is dynamic events. These events will pop up and show you on the map, mini map, and content guide when you are nearby to them. These will have specific tasks listed that when performed give you credit towards completion of that dynamic event. Based on how much completion credit you have earned, this will reward you with either a bronze, silver, or gold completion reward and scale your reward up. These can be combat related or non-combat related and also scale, generally speaking, to how many people are in the the area to encourage teamwork and let everyone get a fair shot at doing it. With dynamic events, there are also group events, which are generally scaled to be harder and only possible with a small group of people at least, as well as some maps having a meta event, or world boss as they can be known, which is a large, sometimes map-spanning dynamic event with multiple stages that requires many people to complete. Some of these meta events are extremely fun, and others not so much. Map tips. If you hover over any of these icons on the upper section of the map, you'll notice that whatever icon you hover over, all icons of that type on your map will have a glowing ring appear. This is to help you find that last pesky heart or hidden vista or point of interest. Do note that there is a sweet spot for this, and if you're too zoomed out, it will not work. Another thing you'll notice as you explore the map is this watercolor effect. This is an unexplored region of the map, and you just need to go walk over near it to reveal it. You can hold alt and left click to display a personal marker if you're trying to go somewhere specific that will help you navigate there via minimap. Shift left click to ping and your party members can see this, and shift right click and drag lets you draw on the map. Scrolling the mouse wheel or clicking the zoom ruler on the right will change your zoom, and below that is surface level selection. The mini map at the bottom is essentially a mini map. It also displays the same thing that your world map does, but only for the region you are in when you are panning around. You can change the size and position of it, click the star button to pan to your story, pan to your character, and toggle rotation with the pointer button, or open your world map from here. It also displays the time, either your local time, server time, time or in-game Tyrian time depending on your setting. Now that you know the basics of what things are what on the map, it's time to get out there, explore, do tasks, and most importantly, smack stuff. Generally speaking, aside from a few specific cases, your number 1 through 5 skills will be determined by your equipped weapon. If you're dual wielding, 1 through 3 will be your main hand, and 4 and 5 are your offhand, so you can mix and match for interesting combinations. Each weapon on each class has a general sort of toolkit, for example, the swords on warrior are more focused on lead damage, while the maces are more focused on defense and control ability. You can view a breakdown of these at any point after the tutorial in the build tab under weapon skills on your hero panel. The number six slot is your healing ability slot. Number seven through nine are your utility skills, and the number 10 is your elite skill. By level 31, you will have all of these slots unlocked, but you can view them at any time after the tutorial by going to the build tab and clicking slot skills. These are unlocked using hero points as we discussed in the previous section but you won't be able to spend them until after level 11. Once you get to level 8, you'll unlock another relatively unique Guild Wars 2 aspect, which is underwater combat. You'll be given a rebreather, which allows you to stay underwater forever and replaces your standard helmet while underwater, as well as a special aquatic weapon. Depending on your class, you can choose one or two of the following, harpoon gun, spear, or trident. At the bottom of your weapon skills tab are some unique skills known as downed skills. Once you reach level 5, you will unlock the downed state system. This means when when your hit points reach zero, you will go into a downed state and will need to try to rally back to the fight. The goal is to either land a killing blow on an enemy, patch yourself up to full health, or survive long enough for your allies to rescue you. If you reach zero hit points in the downed state, you will need to wait for an ally to revive you or return to the nearest waypoint. These downed skills you get access to are class specific and vary depending on if you are underwater or on land. When downed underwater, your objective will be to kill something fully to rally or swim to the top of the water's surface and stay there to heal. This is a good time to also cover boons and conditions. If you're familiar with the term, these are buffs and debuffs. They appear above your utility skills at the bottom of the screen. Boons typically have a gold background and conditions a red background. Boons, broadly speaking, will give your character positive benefits such as increased speed or health regeneration per tick, while conditions will do negative things to your character such as immobilize you or cause uh, burning damage per tick. SPVP is available to you as soon as you complete 
complete the tutorial instance. You can view your SPVP information or join into it by clicking the crossed swords at the top of your screen in the menu bar. This mode is separate from your PvE character gear and leveling progress. Upon joining this mode or the PvP lobby, you will automatically be set to level 80 with all of your skills and specializations unlocked. However, if you don't have the expansions, you will still be unable to use those elite specializations. In the lobby, you will be able to manage your PvP build and equipment, which is all standardized, so there is an even playing field between players. No need to spend 40 hours grinding to get the best PvP gear you can for this season. Make sure you go into the lobby at least once on your character to set up your build, weapons, and everything before diving into a match, or you're going to have a bad time. There's also training dummy golems here that you can use to test out different abilities and specs, so you can even come here to test things out if you really want to before committing your hard-earned hero points to them in PvE. I'm not doing a deep dive into the game mode here. I will have a brief guide video available for structured PvP that dives into a little bit more about setting up your character, different ways you can approach it, different game modes, as well as what the panels and games look like. I am by no means a structured PvP specialist, so I'm not going to do a super in-depth guide on how to be a super elite top tier player, but I can at least get you into the game and having fun world versus world. This isn't super relevant to you now, as it's only available after reaching level 60, but world versus world is the large-scale server-based combat in which entire servers go head-to-head -head in a three-way combat for control over four different maps all at the same time. It resets on a weekly basis and can be pretty fun. This game mode does utilize your PvE character's gear, weapons, and traits, so I wouldn't recommend diving in until you reach level 80, get yourself a full set of exotics, and are pretty comfortable with your character. Uh, the gist of it is to group up with people to capture supply camps, use that supply to build defenses or siege equipment, and capture and defend towers, keeps, or even the legendary Stone Mist Castle. There's progression inside of World vs. World with the ranking system, allowing you to specialize to increase your power and capabilities in different siege weapons, defenses, or even just overall buffs to your character while in this game mode. I will be creating and have available a World vs. World brief start guide, which will show you a little bit more about the game mode, different concepts, as well as go more in-depth about rewards and playstyles. I am by no means a top-tier World vs. World player either, however, I can get you you into the game and understanding some concepts of it, but that is not the focus of this video. This is to get new players started. If you're interested in that, check the description. Inventory management, gathering, and crafting. Now that you've been running around killing things and getting loot, I'm sure you're wondering what to do with all of it. Well, have no fear, the savior of bag space is here. The first thing to take note of is this little button here that looks like a box with an arrow. This button deposits all materials that can be used for crafting straight into your bank's material storage. Your material storage can hold up to 250 of each individual crafting material in the game that goes into it and can be expanded by using gems to purchase expansions to this. Once you've done that, you can travel to a vendor like a task or heart vendor, or a merchant that is marked by piles of coins or bags on the map, and sell off the items you don't need here. Anything more valuable, you can right-click to sell on the Black Lion Trading Post, which is a server-spanning marketplace like an auction hall where players can buy and sell items. If you're brand new on a free-to-play account, you'll have to wait about a week to use this feature, otherwise purchasing the expansions will immediately unlock this. You can buy and sell things from anywhere in Tyria, however, to pick up your gold and items, you'll need to visit a Black Lion Trading Post location usually found in the major cities. In addition to selling, you can salvage many unwanted items using salvage kits which can yield you crafting materials among other things. You can buy these salvage kits from the same merchants you can buy gathering tools from generally, which we'll cover in the next section. One final note, especially while leveling up, you may be given gear that is unable to be sold or salvaged. You will just have to destroy this gear and to clear it out of your inventory as it is simply meant to help you on your journey. Gathering. Unlocked at level 9, gathering is a great way to earn experience as you explore and fill up your material storage. There is no gathering skill in this game, and each character can gather wood, ore, and plants across Tyria. Gathering tools needed to do this are limited in use, and you'll have to purchase more from merchants. They also only work up to a certain level range as shown on the tooltip, eventually capping out at Orichalcum tools at level 60. These tools do work to collect resources down below their levels, but not up past 
past their levels. If you are ever getting ruined material scraps when harvesting from gathering nodes, this means your tools aren't a high enough level and you should go purchase new ones as soon as possible. For rafting, once you're past level 10 and can go into the main cities, you can use those hard-earned crafting materials in the various crafting skills. Any character can have two active crafting skills at once, but you can have more than that, but will have to pay to swap between them. I personally just recommend creating additional characters and having two on each character as any important craftable things as far as endgame rewards, legendary items, etc. are always account bound, meaning you can move these items freely between your own characters via the bank system. Like just about everything in Guild Wars, gaining experience in the crafting skills will also net you experience for your overall character level. It works out to be 10 character levels per discipline that you completely max out. If you really wanted to do this, it does mean that you can level a character entirely through crafting, though as I said before, I really don't recommend this. I do intend on making a Guild Wars 2 crafting tutorial video as well, uh, but that will be coming in the near future. It is a rather in-depth system compared to most MMO crafting, but not so in-depth that you can't figure it out yourself if you'd like to. The Bank Found in major cities and some other locations by default, the bank is where you can access your account-wide storage. Anything you put in here is accessible by all characters on this account. This, in addition to crafting stations, is where you can view your material storage as well. This is where your magical deposit all materials button has been sending everything. You can purchase via gems bank slot extenders as well to increase how many tabs your bank has. Achievements. This is one of my favorite parts. By now you've likely earned a few achievements and we'll talk about those now. You can access the Achievement panel by pressing H by default and navigating to the Achievements tab in the Hero panel, which has the little arena net symbol on it. Here, you will see your total achievement points displayed at the top left and see how many more points you need to get to your next reward. These chests will award you from your overall achievement points a special currency known as laurels, some gold, and sometimes permanent account-wide bonuses to how much gold or karma you earn, unique skins, and more. Of note, you can also earn laurels through your daily login reward system available when you purchase any Guild Wars 2 expansions. Here on this main summary page of the Achievements tab, you can scroll down and see your recently completed achievements, as well as some suggested or nearly completed achievements. See your unlocked rewards such as skins, and view your permanent account bonuses. On the left, you can view your titles available to you, which will appear to other players when selected. You can click the cogwheel next to the search bar to filter by certain things, or you can use the search bar to search the name of an achievement. There are also tabs breaking down different categories of achievements such as world versus world, PvP, or story. Achievements almost always reward achievement points, and can sometimes reward things such as skins, titles, items, or even just loot to sell. There's achievements for every type of playstyle to shoot for here, and this is something that tends to occupy a lot of my time when I play. Social tips. Let's talk about the social aspects of the game. To get started, click the little chat bubble at the bottom to show the chat window. The cogwheel will let you change some settings about the overall chat window. You can also click the little drop down arrow next to a chat tab to show what filters it has. Guild chat is global only to that specific guild's members. Say chat is for nearby players. Map chat goes to the entire shard of the region map you are in. Party goes to your immediate five party members. Squad will go to the entire squad, up to 50 people, squads being advanced groupings of players made of up to 10 parties, and team goes to just members of your team in PvP situations, and whisper just goes to the individual person you whisper. At any point in the game, you can shift-click a waypoint or point of interest on the map or an item in your bag to put it into the chat, and then you can type along with it. If you can control-click any of these, it will instantly be sent to whatever chat channel you are in. Linking points of interest and waypoints can be extremely helpful when asking for assistance with a difficult event or trying to meet up with people. Speaking of whispers, let's look at the contacts and LFG G pane. This can be opened with Y by default or found at the top of your screen. The top tab of this is your friends. People who you have added to your friends list can be found here. You can right click them to whisper them, invite them to groups, and so on. The second tab is looking for group. This is full of people looking to perform specific content and need people to come help them. Many meta events will have groups here when it is close to their time, as well as dungeon groups. The third tab is the followers tab. Anyone in this tab has added you to their friends list, but you have not added them to your friends list. The final tab is the blocked tab. Anyone you've blocked from seeing their messages can be found here. 
Mail. Press the envelope button at the top of your screen to open up your mailbox. The game's NPCs will sometimes send you story letters, and you can read them here. You can also compose and receive mail from any Guild Wars 2 player here. If you're on a free account, you'll have some limitations on this, but once you own an expansion, you can mail to anybody. You can mail gold, items, and text to people. This does cross the NAEU server divide. Guilds. I know it's quite shocking that there are guilds in Guild Wars 2, but once you catch your breath from that jump scare, press the G key by default or click the shield at the menu bar. You can join up to five guilds at once. They each have different chat channels to talk in, but you can only represent one guild at a time. Guilds have many features such as guild halls, buffs to apply to your character, and their own activities they can do together. Well, this is the final section of the video. This last bit just contains some bits of odds and ends as far as settings and control tips I highly recommend. So if you don't care at all, I thank you for watching this far. Drop a like and sub for more Guild Wars 2 content coming to your timeline soon. For those of you that want to elevate your game, this section is for you. Going into the options menu, make sure that AoE loot on interact and auto loot auto pickup are checked if they aren't already. I also recommend turning on show all usable object names. This will show the name of many objects through the game that you will need to use for story quests, hearts, and even just hidden loot chests and achievement items hidden around the world that you can see so much easier with this setting turned on. It is a lifesaver. Turning on target health percentage is always a good idea. I cannot urge you strong enough to turn off double tap to evade. It seems like a good idea, but there will be a point in your career that if you don't turn this off, you will be about to finish a jumping puzzle, a super frustrating fight, or something like that, only to double tap off a cliff and die to gravity. If you turned off one setting, this would be it. I also like to turn off stop auto attack on target change, as it makes cleaving through large groups of enemies during dynamic events significantly easier, allowing you to get more credit faster. Something I don't think a lot of people play around with enough is the dynamic HUD, which is super nice for those of you who prefer a more cinematic game as opposed to a hyper HUD MMO optimized experience. Uh, this allows you to disable some elements of the HUD either permanently or have them come back up only in combat. Uh, there are some presets here to play around with, so you could have your map vanish when you're in combat or have your, your health and utility bars vanish when you're outside of combat so that you have more screen space to just experience the game. There are so many more tricks, pieces of advice, walkthroughs, and more I want to share with you all, and I will in time. But for now, I've got you set off on the right foot. Let fortune favor the bold, my adventuring friends. I thank you all for watching to the end of the video. I hope it was helpful to you. Tap that like and subscribe to help more people find the video and get started in the amazing world of Tyria.